Gemma? Hello? Gemma, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, I can. go go ahead. Good good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Why don't you go ahead? We've got some journalists here. Why don't you go ahead and give us a, a brief overview and then we'll take some questions. Okay, thank you so much, and I'm so sorry about the connectivity issue. So, uh, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues there in New York. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to, to listen to this briefing. I'm here on the ground in Pemba, uh, one week into the Cyclone Kenneth response, where we're still doing absolutely everything that we can to reach people who've been impacted by this cyclone. So let me start with the situation as it is on the ground. Uh, first of all, you're all aware, and you've all seen the images of how Cyclone Kenneth tore through an entire swath of this country that had never before been hit by a cyclone. So we're here in Cabo Delgado, where people are not used to being hit by cyclones. This was something entirely new in the satellite era for this population. And it flattened entire villages to the ground. These are not huge villages. They're small villages. But that doesn't mean that we should care any less about them as an international community. I've heard a lot of people speaking about the number of people affected as if the headline figure is the key here. That is not the key for us. The key for us is how terribly and tragically these people have been impacted. And bear in mind that these are people who are starting from one of the highest levels of poverty in Mozambique, let alone in the world. So these were people already tremendously vulnerable, and they then had a huge shock hit them, and that was followed by days of torrential rain, where many of them were stuck out in the open with no home to go to, no food to eat, and no water to drink that was clean. We have made progress, and I'm delighted to be standing here today without rain falling around me. For the last couple of days, we've been able to get all of the air rotations that we needed to up in the air and down on the ground into these isolated communities and to start getting assistance out. More than 27,000 people have already been reached with food assistance and more are being reached as I stand here. Distributions are ongoing in each of the hardest hit districts. So that's from the islands, Ebo Islands, that's an island district, Kisanga district, and up in Makomia district, both in Makomia town, which is accessible by road, and uh, the coastline of Makomia, which is only accessible at this time by air. So the response operation is moving. We've got bottles of Fateza, which is water purification that has gone out to multiple locations, giving people access to clean water, sometimes for the first time in days. And we've got shelter, which is absolutely vital for these people who've been exposed to the elements. Plastic tarps and sheeting are moving out. We've had plain load driving these last days, funded by different, that are now getting out to communities on the ground. So we really are making progress, but we've got a long way to go. And that we face two big challenges here. One is the access. So we still are facing many areas that are only accessible by road. The second is the funding. I think, as you all know, when we started this operation, which I said before, would be an entirely new humanitarian response in any other context. If this had hit any other country, we would be mobilizing the entire international system to respond to this crisis. But here we're doing it six weeks after Cyclone Sky, and we're doing it in a context where we were already stretched to the bone on the resources. So we were less 30% funded for Cyclone die when this new crisis hit. And we're now operating two responses on a shoestring budget. We desperately need more money to come in. The risk there, so a cholera outbreak was confirmed last night. We've got cholera cases now reported in Pemba, where I'm standing, which is an endemic area for cholera uh, in Mozambique, and in Makusi, which is a district that, that neighbors Pemba. We've been talking about this risk of waterborne disease, and it's next year with us. The good news is we've learned a lot of lessons from Idai, and we're acting quickly. Our colleagues who work on water and sanitation and our health colleagues are doing everything they can working around the clock to contain this outbreak. There's already an operational cholera treatment center in Pemba, and more treatment centers, treatment units are being set up uh, over the course of today and into tomorrow. So while we're concerned, we are acting swiftly, and we do hope that we can make progress to contain that outbreak. But it highlights the risk that people across the region do still face. We've got one piece of good news, which is that the flooding that we expected to be severe is, is less severe than we thought. 
we do still have people, and, and the team carried out a flyover today of the districts that are in the southern region of Cabo Delgado and the northern region of Nampula. And we do have people in places like Matuje, which is still cut off by road, half of the district accessible, half of it not. So the flooding is as widespread as we saw in Yadai, but it doesn't mean that it hasn't left people unreachable. It most definitely has. I do want to just say a couple more things before I open up the floor. Uh, one of the messages that we are really trying to pass is around climate change. This is a consequence of climate change, and it is a clarion call to the world to wake up. Not only do we have the two cyclones that have hit Mozambique in the past six weeks, we're now looking at Bonnie, which is uh, impacted from also the Indian Ocean into Asia in this same period. So we've got three cyclones coming out of the same ocean over that period of time. And it is really a call to all of us that the climate is changing, that the weather patterns that we are seeing are changing, and that we are seeing severe weather events. And what is utterly tragic is that these weather events are impacting the people who have had the least contribute to climate change in the world. So as we try to mobilize the humanitarian response, just the international community, we must stand in solidarity with the people of Mozambique and the government of Mozambique at this challenging time. They are suffering something that they did not cause. So we have an obligation as an international community to mobilize in support of them. And secondly, we've got to be looking at the longer term. I'm a humanitarian. I stand here today knowing full well that there is action that must be taken around the world to try and mitigate the worst of climate change from impacting the people who deserve it, deserve it least in the world. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, all of you, for the time, and I'm very happy to take any questions and, and comments. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, Maggie? Hi, Gemma. Thanks so much for doing the briefing and for all your hard work. Um, I just want to know uh, how Cyclone Kenneth is impacting relief efforts uh, to Adai victims. I mean, are the two overlapping and is it uh, complicating your response to the first cyclone? And you mentioned that rain had stopped, but um, I think I had read that there might be more rain coming. So I don't know how this might additionally complicate uh, your efforts and are you concerned about it? Thank you. Over to you, Gemma. Thank you so much. Two questions that I'm very passionate about. And, and firstly, sorry, I think while I was speaking quickly, I spoke about communities only accessible by road. Of course, I meant by air. Um, and that comes to your second question about the rain. But let me start first with how this is impacting our response to a die. We have said from the get-go that this response needs new staff, it needs new supplies, and it needs new support in terms of financial resources. Unfortunately, as I stand here one weekend, we are seeing some of that come through. For example, the, the plane loads of shelter that have come in, more food that's coming in. But the reality, the sad reality, is we are, to a certain extent, having to take some of the things and some of the staff that had been well-intentioned for Cyclone die and to shift those over to this response because we simply cannot afford any more days to go by without reaching people. So there is a response. It's a response that's to do with the resources that we have available. But at the same time, we are confident that across the two responses, we are doing everything that we can. We are stretched. We are tired. We are limited. But within that context, we are still reaching people from Beira every single day. There are still people going out there who are still assisting people in that region. There's a lot of activity going on and still a huge hub and a large number of staff who are present on the ground there. And here we're scaling up every single day. But we would be kidding ourselves if we didn't acknowledge that there has been an impact. You can't have two cyclones in six weeks and expect to run the same response for both. As I said, we do believe that we're doing a good job. We do believe that we're reaching people, but it is really tough out here on the ground. So secondly, then, in terms of the rain, uh, when I say it stops, for us, it's a day-to-day, hour-to-hour situation. We've had a good weather couple of days, and for that, we are tremendously grateful. But we do know that the forecasts are not yet clear, and we have seen that rains are still possible. What does that mean first for us? It means that the areas that are inaccessible by road will remain inaccessible by road if these rains continue to fall. That's number one. Secondly, it means that accessing those areas by air becomes even more challenging because some of the flights and some of the helicopter lifts that we aim to do, we can't get off the ground in torrential rain. 
So it means, in a nutshell, that there are people who we can't access on the days when we see torrential rain. That's number one. But much more importantly is number two, which is that for the people who are out in these areas who have lost everything, it, these days of rain mean both that they are exposed to the elements and that the assistance that we are striving to get for them uh, are, are delayed. Thank you, Sherwin. Hi, Jim. It's Sherwin from the SABC. Um, you know, as much as we talk about the immediate needs on the ground and, and, and the, the response, what's needed in the long term here? Yeah, I mean, if we look back at Idai and the devastation it, 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 it wreaked on, on places like Beira, can you describe for us what it looks like where you are and what your estimation is of the need in the long term in terms of building back uh, for those communities? Go ahead, Gemma. Sure. I'm, I'm honestly not the best place. I am a tried and true humanitarian, so my focus is on the now and it is on saving lives. What I will say is a couple of things. One is that these people in these regions are in truly incredible. So when I went out just yesterday, um, I was out in Makojo, or the day before, sorry, I was out in Makojo, which is one of the areas on the coast uh, that has been really hard hit with, with most of that the houses flattened to the ground, the health facility, um, the roof was off, the, the beds were destroyed, the cold chain was damaged because there's no vaccines, uh, the water supply was down, the electricity was down. Uh, so these people had literally nothing. Now, what was incredible there was these people were already rebuilding. Um, in many respects, they're not waiting for us. They're taking what materials are available. They're using that to rebuild the roof so that they can have somewhere safe to sleep. So the rebuilding effort starts from day one in a crisis like this, and it starts first and foremost with the people and the communities who have been affected, and we must acknowledge and respect their incredible resilience. The longer-term piece here is, is going to be challenging. Not so much the shelter piece is important, looking at where people live and whether they'll be safe in the future. That's something that the government is considering and something that there are ongoing discussions around. But the big piece that, that's not so much the long term, but the mid term that we are deeply concerned about is food security. So think about cyclone diet hit right before the harvest, the main harvest in the central region. There's a small winter harvest that was due to come after that, but that was itself planted because we had heavy rains in mid-April. So for the central region, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of hectares of crops that have been damaged, a harvest that's been lost, and a winter harvest that was relatively small and, and certainly not what it needed to be to get people by. Here in the northern region, this cyclone hit in the middle of the harvest. And what that meant was that people who had harvested crops lost what they'd harvested because it was wet, it was blown away, it was ruined, and the crops that hadn't been harvested are completely gone. So what we are looking at is a, a desperate need to rebuild people's livelihoods, but also we've got to promise that we are facing the very high likelihood of rising food insecurity in the months ahead. These are also coastal communities. They lost their boats. They lost their fishing nets. Again, you see incredible things. You see people out there using mosquito nets to catch fish so that they can continue to feed their families. So they're rebuilding their lives as we come in to try and help them. But this will be a long recovery. Thank you. Any more questions? G Gemma, thank you very, very much uh, for, for your time. Good luck to, to you and your, and your colleagues. And we very much appreciate the, the time you gave us. Thank you all so much for the time and for keeping us in the news. Your attention on us is truly appreciated. These people do need the world's help, and you putting it in the headlines helps us to help them. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gemma. Bye. Bye.